Good evening, everyone. Welcome, Trinity Baptist. Welcome to Wednesday night Bible study. Welcome to all of our guests. Welcome to those of you that are turning, tuning in on Facebook Live. If you have your Bibles with you this evening, let's turn to the book of 1 John, chapter 3. 1 John, chapter 3. Good place to be when it's snowing outside, isn't it? Amen? Only have three more verses to finish 1 John chapter 3. But we're only going to do one verse tonight. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Let's ask the Lord's blessing on the reading of his word. Father, we do ask your blessing as we read and consider the truth of your word that we be not hearers only, but doers of your precious and preserved and holy word. Amen. We're going to look at verse 22 tonight. That's going to be the focus for this evening's study. And we'll start reading, though, at verse 21. 1 John chapter 3, verse 21. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. Verse 22. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments, and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And whatsoever we ask, verse 22 says, we receive of him. Don't you like the way that sounds? I like that. I like the way that sounds, just like Romans 10, 13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I love that inclusiveness of whosoever in Romans 10, 13. You know why? Because I'm a whosoever. It doesn't discriminate. From the very first time I heard the word whosoever explained... It has warmed my heart. I rejoice that God has made salvation through Jesus Christ available to all, whosoever. I'm so glad that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Aren't you glad that God has opened wide the gate of invitation to all? To anyone, to everyone, to whosoever. Whosoever will enter by the straight gate, by the narrow way of salvation. Calling upon the name of the Lord. Oh yes, whosoever may enter. But the truth of the matter is, it must be the Jesus way. The narrow way. What did Jesus tell Thomas? No man cometh to the Father but by me. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, admitting that you're a sinner, bound for hell, with no hope of redeeming yourself, no church, no denomination, no religion can save you, except the sinner trust in the precious blood of Jesus Christ that cleanseth us from all sin, be sure your sins will escort you. They will usher you straight into the fires of hell. But thank God, whosoever will may come. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The problem is, there are many whosoever won't. Many will not call. They will not come. Why? It's a matter of the will. Whosoever will. Some will, some will not. Jesus said, And ye will not come to me, that ye may have life, in John 5, verse 40. Just as Paul points out qualifications 
to be saved in his writings. He writes, whosoever will. John writes in our text tonight, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Now remember, John is writing to the church. He's writing to the believer, and his purpose is to show us another assurance of salvation. What is that assurance? Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. We receive of God. God promises to give us whatsoever we ask as if we could expect anything our hearts desire. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Psalms, the 37th Psalm. Psalm 37. And we're going to read verses 3 through 5. Psalm 37, verse 3, we read, Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Verse 4, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. I remember the first time I heard that. I heard that God would give me the desires of my heart. It was like, we better start clearing the basement out in the attic, because I wanted a lot of stuff. I was thrilled. I had lots of desires. To my mind, it sounded like God was just waiting to pour out blessings, and I was ready to get them. The thing I didn't understand is that God wanted me to get rid of my own selfish, worldly desires so he could fill my heart with his desires. God wants his desires to be my desires. Boy, that sounds like a political party. Except God's desires are always pure. They're always good. They're always right. And they're always holy. God's desires are perfect. And he wants to give them to us. He wants them in our hearts. You ever notice how God is always after the heart? It seems like the heart is God's main focus in our relationship with him. As far as God's concerned, turn in your Bibles to the book of Mark, chapter 7. Mark, chapter 7. Mark, chapter 7. The Pharisees are complaining to Jesus that his disciples were eating with unwashed hands. Whew, good thing they didn't have COVID back then, huh? They had something worse. They had leprosy. Wow. Lest we think the Old Testament doesn't apply to us Christians, Jesus quotes to the Pharisees in Mark chapter 7, verse 6, from the book of Isaiah. Let's read Mark 7, verse 6. He answered and said unto them, Well, hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites? As it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Matthew, Mark, Luke, all three Gospels record Jesus instructing that the love for the Father should be with all our hearts. The first and great commandment. This is the heart of the matter. God wants to fill the Christian's heart with his desires. Then, that is what we'll think about. What we think about is what we'll spend our time pursuing 
Romans 12, 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The Christian will only grow or mature. The Christian will only be transformed when his mind is renewed. How does that happen? God must give us the desires of our hearts. Turn to the book of Luke. We're at Mark. Next book is Luke. Chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, and we're going to look at verse 45. Luke 6, 45. And we read, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the, for of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Proverbs 4 In verse 23, doing a little heart surgery here. Proverbs 4.23, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. God gives us the desires of of his heart. God gives us the desires of our heart through his word. God builds our faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word of God bathed in prayer. When our heart's desires change, we gladly will change our minds. Repent. Confess our sins. 1 John 1, 9. Hide God's word in our hearts that we might not sin against him. Psalm 119, 11. And of course, there's obedience. To obey is better than sacrifice. We become doers of the word and not hearers only. When God has your heart, he has all of you. Lock, stock, and barrel. He has you right where he wants you, in the center of his will. What did Jesus say? What did he pray? Father, not my will, but thy will be done. If Jesus prayed, Father, not my will, but thy will be done, how much more do I need to be in the center of God's will? The best thing I, or the best thing anyone can do, is give God your heart. What's that called? I surrender. Amen? And I've said all that so far to say this. That is why the 22nd verse of 1 John starts with the word and. Look at it. And. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Verse 22 is the result of verse 21 that reads, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence towards God and whatsoever we ask. The heart of the Christian believer will not condemn them if they are being taught right and they're making a sincere effort to honor the Lord by faithfully reading their Bibles attending church, serving where they can, praying for others, supporting the ministry with their time and treasure. When you're doing what you can in obedience to the Lord's calling, you can come with confidence towards God. And whatsoever you ask, you receive of Him. Interestingly, The word prayer is not mentioned anywhere 
in the book of 1 John. We do know that confessing our sins in chapter 1 and verse 9 is prayer. If we confess our sins in prayer, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. A rather famous evangelist and author of Days Gone By, that means he's dead, John R. Rice, wrote a book on prayer titled Prayer. And there was a subtitle, Asking and Receiving. In his book on prayer, Rice gives as much space to receiving as he does asking. He points out, it's not the form, it's not the style, it's not the eloquence of our prayers that matter, but the receiving. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. In his book on prayer, Rice takes 283 pages to say what John says here in verse 22 in 23 words. The epistle of John's was one of the last books written in the Bible. Paul and the other New Testament authors have already written their books, and I believe they're already gone home to be with the Lord. John assumes the early Christian understands the necessity of prayer. For prayer, in some form or another, is mentioned over 500 times in the Bible. Prayers mention more than love, more than heaven, more than hell. I want you to look at something. Turn, if you will, to just the second chapter of John. John chapter 2. We already know that prayer is mentioned in chapter 1 by confession. Let's look at verse 6 of chapter 2. This is not all exhaustive. These are just a couple high points. Verse 6 says, He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. Did Jesus walk in prayer? And so should we. Look at verse 20 in chapter 2. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. You know that you should be praying. I know that I should be praying. Look at chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. If we're going to be like Jesus, we need to be people of prayer. Look at verse 11 in chapter 3. You'll like this one. For this is the message that ye have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. If you're going to love me, you're going to be praying people. I'll guarantee you that. So, John outlines many indications, characteristics that God will manifest in the believer, prayer not being the least of them. Once again, don't forget, this verse is another verse of assurance. It's an indicator of salvation as well as Christian maturity. John is stating that one of the ways you can tell you're saved is that you receive whatsoever you ask. It's just one of the indications. But John says the Christian living for God will receive whatsoever he asks for. Look at that. Look at 1 John 3.22. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. John, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, does not write what we ask, we receive of him. 
He doesn't write whatever we ask we receive of him. He writes, and whatsoever we ask we receive of him. As I was preparing this uh, lesson, I was curious as to whether the word whatsoever John is using here in this verse might indicate anything special. You know, uh, more, something more special than just what or whatever. That's where that came from. You probably didn't know that, didn't you? Somebody tells you something you don't like, you go, whatever. I didn't find anything, really. The only thing I could find was what the Noah Webster 1828 Dictionary says. It says it means the same thing as what, but whatsoever is an old word that is not used much anymore. It's archaic. Whatsoever. And I thought when I read it, it's not archaic in my Bible. I typed the word what and the word whatsoever right in the center of the page I was working on, and I highlighted them both in, in yellow. Not in a sentence or anything, just standing alone on the page. And I did that to remind myself not to forget about them, because I thought maybe I'll, maybe I'll think about them some more. I thought I might think about their significance. A couple of days later, I came up with something. Now, that scares me when I say I came up with something. Believe me, this is not some great theological discovery, some new truth, at least as far as I can tell. If I come up with any of my own ideas, I try to run the other way. Original thought, when it comes to biblical truth, can be dangerous. Warning, <laughs> you're entering the danger zone. But whatsoever spoke to me. It might not speak to you. It might not do the same for you. If this thought violated scripture, if it wasn't God honoring, it wouldn't be worth mentioning, would it? No. If it wasn't something God honoring, the Holy Spirit would never have prompted John to pen it, though, would he? Amen. Whatsoever shows us something that God desires to put in our hearts. Think about it. John could have written what we ask we receive of him. Wouldn't that be saying the same thing? Maybe. What we ask we receive of him. By the way, side note, all the modern Bible versions, almost all of them, split whether they use the word what or the word whatever in this verse. The King James Bible says, whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Let's break that word down, whatsoever. That's a compound word. It's three words in one. Whatsoever. And let's do this. Let's read verse 22 just a little bit differently. Look at it in your Bible. What if we separated those words and said, And what we ask we receive of him, so ever keep asking. I don't think it hurts anything. Look at it again. And what we ask, we receive, so we will ever keep asking of him. Do you see it? Whatsoever is an encouragement, I believe, that God builds into this verse, so we will keep living our lives ever to please him and so ever keep asking. Most people don't receive much when it comes to prayer. You know why? They get discouraged, and they seldom ask. James says, ye have not because ye ask not. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. An indication of salvation, yes, an encouragement to the saved to continue asking, I can think of another verse similar to that. 
I think it's in Thessalonians 5.17, the first one. Pray without ceasing. And what we ask, we receive of him, so we ever will do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Why? Why do we? Because. That's why. Because we keep his commandments. Isn't that what the word says? Because we keep his commandments. Because. What causes God to give the Christian whatsoever he asks? Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. What causes the Christian to want to keep God's commandments? Because whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Can we as believers trust God to keep his promises? Does God have your heart? Do you honor him with more than your lips? When it comes to prayer, do you put it off like me? Or do you tell yourself, I must be about my father's business? Do you approach your service to God like Nehemiah? I'm doing a great work when it comes to prayer. You don't have to tell anyone that like Nehemiah did, but you ought to think it. You should feel that way about living a life pleasing to God, shouldn't we? Amen. Now we know that there is only one man that has ever kept God's commandments. The Son of Man, Jesus himself, God in the flesh. We are taught from the beginning of our Christian lives that the Ten Commandments were God's looking glass to show us our sin and that we needed a Savior. And they do testify of that. For who other than Jesus could hope to keep even one of them? When John wrote, because we keep his commandments, he's referring to our desire to love God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. When that is our heart's desire, it is pleasing in God's sight. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. And what we ask, we receive of him, so we ever will do those things that are pleasing in his sight. There are a multitude of verses in the Bible that deal with pleasing God. I'm drawn to the verse that in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, that says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. We must have faith to please God. How do we get that God-pleasing faith? It's engraved right here on the glass. Romans 10, 17. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The ultimate proof of our faith and assurance is when we walk by faith and not by sight. By faith, we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Ponder this. Ask yourself this question. Does it really matter? Just how important is it that the Christian receives whatsoever he asks for? Is anything going to change if God answers all my prayers? What if we seldom, if ever, receive anything we ask for? We're still going to heaven. Oh, sure, we hear about someone recovering from an illness that we prayed for with, along with the rest of the church, and we rejoice, we rejoice when they recover. And it's great. And we ought to pray for others. But did my prayer really have anything to do with their recovery? Am I walking by faith? Am I doing those things that are pleasing in his sight? 
picture this in your mind. We're going to draw on a piece of paper in our minds a dotted or a dashed line representing a map of everything we think or say or do. Dots and dashes. You go from home to church today. You may have gone to the grocery store today. You may have been having a luncheon or coffee with a friend. You may have had a doctor's appointment today. Everything that you thought or everything that you would say or do is on this piece of paper represented by these dashes and dots. That line will be a solid line if it was bathed in prayer before you went, before you said it, or before you thought it. What percentage of your line would be a solid line on your map? I dare say mine would look like a dot-to-dot -dot child's coloring book that they hadn't colored on yet. See, this just isn't about somebody else. This is personal. This is about me. Would my asking and receiving be an encouragement to the addicted? Would they be encouraged by my prayer life to sell out to God and believe that their prayers could deliver them? Would, you, would your receiving encourage the troubled husband and wife to prayerfully rely on God to heal their marriage? Would the answers to the average Christian prayers convince a young Christian couple that they can prayerfully resist temptation before marriage? Can the people of Trinity Baptist Church claim the promise of 2 Chronicles 7.14? If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Israel was to be God's witness and blessing to all the people of the world because of the promise God had made to Abraham. Turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12 And we'll read at verse 1. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now turn in your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Moses gives some final instruction to Israel before they would enter the promised land. Moses exhorts them to pay heed to that instruction. Verse 1 of chapter 4, we read, Now therefore hearken, listen, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it. Drop down to verse 5. 
In verse 5, it starts out, Behold, I've taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Verse 6, Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations which shall hear all these statutes. Moses is saying that the nations, when they hear these judgments and these statutes, they're going to say, surely this great nation is a wise and an understanding people. When I was looking at that, I thought to myself, I wonder what the nations that surround us think. I'll bet it's not that we're wise and understanding. Verse 7. Now Moses asks the people a question, and this is where I want to concentrate for just a moment. Moses says, For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them? What nation is there where God is so close to them And he's talking about Israel. What nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? Israel could call on him. And they did when they were hungry and he fed them. When they were thirsty, he gave them water. And when they needed protection, he gave them victory in battle. We are to be witnesses to the saving power of God through Jesus Christ. We're also to display the power of God in our daily lives to overcome sin, walking by faith and not by sight. But in everything, by prayer, and supplication with thanksgiving, letting our requests be made known unto God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy 2.8. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere. Luke chapter 18, verse 1. Luke chapter 18, verse 1. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray. And finally, turn to Matthew 7. Matthew 7, verse 7. Matthew chapter 7. Verse 7 and 8. Jesus said in his own red letter words, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Father, we do thank you for the word of God. We do thank you for the Holy Spirit that directed the hands and the minds of the men that wrote your word. We thank you that it's been preserved. 
We thank you that it's infallible. We thank you that it's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And we thank you, and whatsoever we ask, we can expect to receive because we keep your commandments and do those things that are pleasing in your sight. Even so, help us believe that. Help us live that. Forgive the unbelief that we have and cause us to come boldly with confidence unto you, Lord. For Jesus' sake, it's in his name we praise you and thank you. Amen. God bless you. Thanks, everyone, for coming. A couple of prayer announcements before we uh, dismiss. The Burke family, uh, of course, lost, uh, not lost, but Ed passed on to glory this week. There's going to be a service tomorrow at 11 o'clock. For more information on that, you can call the office and get the exact location. I understand if you're a Michigan fan, you're going to have to really like maybe cross your fingers when you go in because it's an Ohio State Hallelujah, Jesus celebration funeral, okay? Pray for the Schlumbaum family, for uh, Tad's dad. He has a heart aneurysm, and I guess he's in the Toledo Hospital. Pray for him. Pray for Bob Nungaster to continue improving in his health. Continue to pray for Pastor Schaefer as uh, he's been fighting this COVID virus. Be in prayer for our pastor's wife, Miss Megan. She's had a few concerns and uh, had to take a trip to the emergency room, but she's home. Pray for her health. Pray for uh, her, her quick recovery. And uh, pray for the family during this time. We do thank you uh, for coming out. We want to mention that uh, more and more people are coming out. If you've gotten your shots... Get on in here. I talked to Rudy and Josie Chapa. If you're watching tonight, I expect you to be here after you get that second shot. Haven't seen them in a long time. I was glad to see them. And uh, they're excited to get back. So, Sunday school, 9.30. Worship service, 10.30. And, of course, Sunday evening services at 5 o'clock. We thank you all for coming. We pray God's blessings on you. Father, we thank you now. We ask, Lord, that you dismiss us with the thought that every person that we pass is either going to heaven or they're not. And so we don't want to take anything for granted, Lord. We pray that you'd lay the weight of eternal souls on our shoulder. Let us not be concerned about our own comfort zone, but let us reach out to a lost and dying world for the cause of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we ask your blessing. Amen.